I'm so pumped with the word of God today. The penultimate message for our sermon series, A Thriving Church. Let's grow with the church. How can this title touch those who are sick, those who are broken, those who lose their jobs, those people who are in need financially, emotionally? How could this message touch those people? It's not my problem. It's God's power that would be displayed today that whatever situation, circumstance you have in life, God will speak to you at the very need of your heart. And I would like to entitle the message today, Let's Grow with the Church. God wants you to grow with the church. God wants you to grow with the church. I've Googled this. I always Google the title of my sermon, and I would like to check if there are other, in the past, there are sermons like that. But you cannot find the same title that I have today, Let's Grow with the Church. All my past sermons, there are the same, you, you could find in the Google, same title, verbatim. Exactly the same title. Because there are millions and billions of sermons already preached in this world. But I was surprised. I can't find this title in the Google. In Google. Let's grow with the church. You can find sermon as such as grow the church. Grow in the church. You could find that. But this you cannot find. I was surprised. But I hope today you could find another title. The same title with Let's Grow with the Church. Because in the church, you have to grow with the church. Meaning, the church should grow with you. And when the church grows, you also grow. It's not right. It's not healthy to just have the church growing and you're not growing. And it's not also healthy for you to grow and the church is not growing with you. That's why I entitled the message today, You Grow With the church, we grow with the church. When the church grows, we grow. When we grow, the church grows. And that's healthy. And today, I'd like to encourage each and every member of this church, visitors, attendees, that we should grow with the church. I want you to grow with the church. I would like to, to start from verse 11 of chapter 5. We are now almost finished. One more sermon next week for the First Thessalonians series. We've learned that this church is just barely months old church because this were, they were established by Paul for three weeks, and now Paul wrote them a letter. Very young church, this Thessalonian church. And they were driven by love, faith, and hope. They were on fire for the Lord, but they, go, they went through problems and trials in life. Paul empowered them, inspired them through the word of God. The, he admonished them. He taught them. And now, we've learned from the past two Sundays about the day of the Lord, the rapture. And Paul taught them how to live waiting for that day of the Lord, for the judgment of God. We need to live wisely. We need to live YOLO. You only live once. You need to live wisely. You need to live with purpose. You need to live ready. And now, the last verse that we read last time from chapter 5, verse 11 it, has, it says something like this. Therefore, encourage one another and build each, up, build each other up just as in fact you are doing. It doesn't say, therefore, encourage others. It doesn't say, build others. But it tells us very explicit in this verse, therefore, Encourage one another. Encourage the person next to you. Encourage the person in front of you. 
Build the person next to you. Build each other. And that person would also build you up, would also encourage you. And that's how we grow together. And when we grow, and that would result to growing church, a thriving church. We need to encourage one another. We don't need to bite one another, to backstab one another, to, uh, to gossip like others. But rather, we need to build them up. We need to encourage because people need encouragement. We need inspiration. We need motivation. We need love. We need compassion. We need to share that to others, that they may be encouraged, that they may be built up in the Lord. Just in fact, you are doing, they're already doing it, but Paul wanted them to do it more and more. And I know you've been encouraging some people, you're building up some people here, but God wants you to do it more and more so that we can grow together with the church. And how can we grow with the church? How can we encourage? How can we build up? How can we build one another up? How? I would like to start with submit to one another. Oh, my God. There you are again. The word submission. The word submit. Too many people in this day, in, the, in this day and age, we are so allergic about the word submission. Because the word submission, as if it implies being the weaker person. We think if we submit to the person, to others, we are being dehumanized. We're losing our value. That we are a lesser person. That we become inferior. But come on, Christians, do not be afraid. Do not be irritated or be annoyed by the word submission or submit. The word submission is literally aligning yourself below others in rank. That's submission. Oh, Pastor Jim, you mean to say I need to put myself below others in rank? Yes, that's a literal meaning of submission. You perceive yourself as a lesser in rank for the benefit of others. That's submission in Christianity. Submission like a submarine, under. Sub means under. Sub, under the mission. You put yourself under the purpose of the mission. Because you have a mission greater than yourself, greater than anybody else. Then you have submit to that purpose of that mission in order for you to fulfill it for the benefit of that mission, for the benefit of others, like husband and wife. Wife should submit to the husband. Also, husband should submit to the wives because we have to submit to one another in order for us to fulfill our mission as husband and wife. Your mission and your goal as a family you have, is greater than yourself. You have to submit, sub, under. If the submarine under marine ocean or water or pool, you you sub you sub you put yourself under. But now it says submission. You put yourself under the purpose of your mission. And it tells us here, I would like to jump first in Ephesians 5:21. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Don't think that only wives should submit to their husband. One another. Because out of your fear, out of your reverence to God. Because I fear God. Because I respect God. Because I, re I revere God. Therefore, I'm going to submit to you. Don't think, don't think that only wives should submit to the husband. All of us. Kids submit to the parents. Parents, there would be times that you need to submit to your kids in order for you to fulfill the purpose, the goal of your family, of your relationship. Don't think that you are a lesser person. Yes, you may be a lesser in rank. You put yourself as a lesser, per, a lesser in rank, not as a person. Do you remember Jesus Christ himself? 
when he came down on earth, he became human. But he, 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 didn't, he didn't use his divinity. He submitted to the purpose of the Father so that people of the world may be saved through his humility, his submission to the Father. But it didn't make him a lesser God. He is still God, perfectly God. He submitted to the Father when he was suffering on the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said, Lord, take away this cup from me. Take away this pain from me, Father. Jesus Christ said because he was suffering. He was about to be crucified. But Jesus Christ said after that, not my will, but yours be done. That he was God. He is God during the time. And he, he continued to be God. He, didn't, he wasn't a lesser God. He remained God. Completely God, completely human. He just submits. So don't be afraid to submit in order for you to achieve the purpose. It says here, submit to one another. If we want to grow as a church, if we want to grow with the church, we need to submit to one another. Let's start reading from verse 12, how to submit to one another. Praise God for sermon series because when we read sermon series, it's verse by verse, not just chapter by chapter. It's verse by verse. We need to tackle every verse that presented to us by the Bible. Now let's read verse 12. It's quite awkward reading this because it pertains to, to me and to the elders. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, that church, of course, the, con the, the, the background of this, the church in Thessalonica, they were the ones addressed here. They were the original readers and the recipient of the letter of Paul to Thessalonica. All right, as if he was saying, now we ask you, Thessalonian church, brothers and sisters, but we can also resonate with this. We could also uh, have this uh, in our lives. Brothers and sisters, Life Expression Church, we ask you to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because their work, because of their work. Now, before we go to the submission of the members or the churches or the brothers and sisters to the pastor or to the elders, there was a great call to the leader or to the pastor, to the one who worked hard among you, to whom you would give a high regard in love to the one who worked hard among you. Listen to this, church. Listen to this. You don't acknowledge, you don't give high regard because of my title. No, it's not. Because I work hard among you. It's not about the title. I don't want to use the word pastor here loosely. It's just a title. But I want you to, see, you to see me with my work or the elders or the leaders of the church because they work hard for you. That's why you give high regard to them. You acknowledge them. You pray for them because they're working so hard for you. It's not because, oh, he's a pastor, he's an elder. That's why I'm going to respect him. I'm going to, to acknowledge him. I'm going to, to, to give my highest regard with love for him because he's a pastor. No. No. That's why the weight here is in the pastor, in the elders, the leaders. Work hard among you. I cannot work hard among you if I'm not submitted to you, Lavish Presence Church. I cannot pray for you. I cannot visit you. I cannot teach you. I cannot labor studying the word of God, preparing the message, praying for every individual in this church. If I'm not submitted to you, who cares? Why would I, why would I waste my time with you, for you? Anyway, I'm just get my, my, my salary. That's fine. Who knows if I'm praying? Who knows if, I, if I'm doing my job as a pastor? Do you see me 24-7? No. You only see me twice a week, once a week here. Anyways, they say pastor just work two hours a week. Yeah, right. Maybe. Yeah, that's true. There are some pastors who would just work two hours a week. When they come into church, that's the only time they work. There are people pastors like that. I hope not, Lord. I hope I'm not that kind of pastor. 
doctor would only work two hours a week. But you know what? Because I am submitted to you. I would sacrifice my family sometimes, my time with my wife, with my time with my kids. I would sacrifice that sometimes. I would sacrifice myself because I would I am submitted to you. I work hard for you. And it's my call. And you acknowledge me and you give me high regard and you pray for me for that. Not because of my title. There are many pastors, elders who are not doing their jobs. Who are just there for money. See, because I am submitted to you. I need to work hard for you. But if I'm not submitted to you, I've only asked for your submission because I deserve to be serve here because I am the pastor of the church. I don't think that's a healthy pastoralship. So I need to be submitted to you. I always align myself below you in rank. I perceive myself as a lesser in rank for your benefit. always ask myself, Lord, help me to do that. I need to be submitted to you. And those people who work hard among you, of course, not only for your pastor, for your elders, also for your life group leaders who are working so hard for you. And mind you, even those parking marshals that we have, they are working so hard for you. This could also be, uh, you, you, could, you could relate it to that. People who's working behind the scenes. You could also pray for them and acknowledge them. And give them your highest regard in love. Because they're working so hard for you. They're submitted to you. Your life group leaders, your parking marshal, your host team, your cuisine team. They are working so hard for you. And give them your highest regard in love. Because they're submitted to God first. And they're submitted to you in order for them to do the good works. To reflect the image of God through their actions, through their service, that you may see God and feel the love of God through them. And now we as members, we also be submitted to them because they are submitted to us, to you. I am submitted to you, therefore you submit to me, we submit to one another. Why? Because of my title? No. Why? Because you are cool, you are giving money. You are tithing, that's why I'm going to submit to you. No, it's not. Because that's the calling of God in our lives as a church. Submit to one another. I will submit to you, you submit to me. We grow with the church together. Right? We admonish, love them, pray for one another. Pray for your member. members would pray for the leaders. That's submission to one another. Because we have a bigger purpose. We have a bigger purpose or mission in mind in this church. To be a loving church. Expressing life to disciple people for the glory of God. One person cannot do this alone. I cannot do this alone. You cannot do it. One life group, one ministry cannot do that alone. We need each other to work together. To be submitted to one another. And here we submit to one another because... And we urge you, brothers and sisters, there you are again, brothers and sisters, the whole church. Warn those who are idle and disruptive. This is one way of growing together. Warn those who are idle, those who are just busy bodies, who, do this, who are just laying back, who doesn't want to do things. You warn them because in the church, we are a body of Christ. If my, my finger is not... Is not moving. There's something wrong with that finger. I need to go to the doctor and ask for a medicine or what's wrong with my finger. I need to check this, Lord, because if you are part of the body. You need to do, you need to do something. And a good brother and sister should warn you because that's for your benefit. If someone warn you, warn you or, or, or check on you, 
or oh, why are you where are you on Sunday? I miss you. Don't be offended when someone check on you, texted you, and message you. Where were you last Sunday? I miss you. There you are again, my pa my pastor, my leader. They are now checking me as if I already backslided. I just missed one night on one Sunday, and now no, no, come on. It's because the love of God that's really shape that's overflowing that their brother or sister or leaders that would like to to express that God wants to express His love to you. That's why they're checking on you. So don't be offended when you are being warned or being, or being reminded of your service for the Lord. And also, disrupted. If there are people who are becoming disrupted, destroying the ministry, it is our responsibility. As a good brother, a good sister. Just look at your family. If your brother or sister in flesh, they're doing something wrong. They are becoming so weird. They're acting weird. Would you, do, would you say something to them or you just keep it for yourself? Mm, let, him, let him do that. Let him suffer the consequences. No. Is that you want to help your brother or your sister? Of course you would like to help your mom, your dad, or your children if that's the case. That's it. A good brother or sister or parents or siblings or children would warn you if you are becoming idle or becoming disrupted. Not only that, there are many disheartened people. This world, we, there are so many disheartened people. They're losing hope, losing job, relationship, finances, sick people. They need, they're disheartened because of this troubled world. And we need to encourage them. Remember, we need to encourage one another. Yeah, today you might be okay, but tomorrow... You might not be okay. And the person whom you encourage today might be the one who will be encouraging you next week, next month, next year. Right? We need to encourage that is hurting. Not only that, help the weak. Not all of us are strong spiritually. Sometimes today you are strong spiritually, you are on fire. But like a roller coaster, sometimes you're down. You need the encouragement of those who are strong in faith. But you know sometimes you are down. And those whom you encourage, whom you strengthen and built up one last week or last month, would be, now, would be the one who's going to, to build you up today. That's why you keep one another. We grow with the church. The church is you and me. We grow with the church. Be patient with everyone. Be patient with everyone. Not with, be, be patient with others. It says everyone. We need patience. We need patience here. Oh, no, he doesn't deserve. He doesn't deserve my patience, Pastor Jun. If only you knew what he, what he did. I don't know, but I know exactly what God did to you. He was patient with you when you were saved. And he's continuously being patient with you. That's what I perfectly know, that God is patient with you. That's why you need to be patient to one another. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. In this church, but not always, we always, it's not, it's not bad roses. Sometimes we say something wrong unintentionally, and you offended someone without knowing it, oh, he wronged me. I'm going to wrong him back. I need to take, I, make, I need to make even. But come on, if someone wrong you, come on, don't take it against them. There's, a, there's, a, there's an enemy behind that. Why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourself be cheated and do wrong. It's okay to be cheated. It's okay to be wrong. I know it's hard. But instead, you yourself who will cheat and do wrong to others. You have, the, you have your God with you. He got your back. He's fighting for you. So do not pay back wrong for wrong. But always strive. 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 Make an effort, my friend, to do what is good. For others, for others, no, for each other, meaning to one another, each other, and for everyone else. You cannot do those things without submission to one another. If you're going to read our passage from chapter 12 to 22 today, you could read 19 imperatives like a machine gun. So many imperatives. From here, from four verses, you could find, acknowledge those who work hard. What else? Hold them in high regard. 
Warn those who are idle. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient. Nobody pays back for wrong, wrong for wrong. Always strive to do what is good. See, in four, five, in four verses, there were already eight imperatives, commands. Come on, it, it, is, it is something. As Paul would like to wrap up the letter to the first Thessalonians. It's, there were so many imperatives here, like a machine gun. Do this, 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 do that, do that, do that. Don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Submit. You cannot do that. You cannot follow that. You cannot obey those things. You cannot fulfill your call to the church or obey the word of God without submitting to one another. If you're going to, put, to elevate yourself and make yourself superior to others, you cannot submit to one another. But if you're going to align yourself below others in rank, then you can submit to this person. Because it is my call, it's my duty as a Christian to submit to others. I'm the boss. I'm manager. I have I graduated of this university with three degrees, with PhD. Why should I submit? Remember, it's Jesus Christ himself. He is God, but he submitted himself. For who? For you, for us. When we are submitting to one another, I submit to you, submit to me, because there are many people who needs God. And that's why you need to submit to one another, that we may reflect the image of God through us, and people would know that there is a real God in this world that who would love us and save us from the, from the fiery furnace of hell. Submit to one another out of your reverence for Christ. If you're going to re continue reading Ephesians 5, there's so many submissions there. From husband, wives to husband, husband to wives, children to the parents, parents to the children, master to the servants, servants to the master. They are submitted to one another in order for them to fulfill their calling as servants, as masters, as children, as parents. Come on, church. Submit to this person next to you. I submit to you. I'm not saying that I make myself as a doormat to you. I'm not saying I'm going to degrade myself or dehumanize myself or go devalue myself just to submit. No, that's not the case. There are times that I would submit to you and there are times that you would submit to me in order for us to fulfill the mission that God has in store for us. And secondly is submit to the will of God. If we want this church, my brothers and sisters, to grow with the church, if you want this church to go together, one another, with the church, we need to submit to the will of God. We are so focused on, the, on finding the will of God in the Bible. Where can I find my wife? What's the job for me? Where should I, where should I, where, where should I stay? When should I live? Where, what's your will, oh God? Come on, set aside those things first. Th these are the, the explicit Explicitly mentioned here, that the three things that, that, is, that, are the will, that is the will of God in our lives. First is rejoice always. You want this church to grow and you want to grow with the church? Rejoice always. That's the will of God. You can rejoice not because it was commanded by God. You can rejoice because it is the will of God. How can I rejoice if I lose my job? How can, I how can I rejoice if my husband left me? How can I rejoice if I, I was diagnosed with this sickness? How can I rejoice? You can rejoice because it's not about the command of God. It's, it's because it's will. It says it, it is the will of God for you to rejoice. Therefore, you can rejoice. God will not command you something without his power for you to do so. Therefore, rejoice always. I don't know what you're going through right now. But I'm telling you, you can rejoice. You will not rejoice because of your pressure or your trials in life. You can rejoice because it is the will of God for you. And when you rejoice, it will bring encouragement, inspiration to people around you, especially in the church. There are many people here today who are suffering from setbacks, from losing their job, financial difficulties. But you know what? I'm so encouraged to see them still working for the Lord. Also working so hard for the Lord for the benefit of other people. And I'm so inspired. I'm so encouraged. 
when I also feel this, when, I, when I'm down, I will, just remind, I will just remind myself with this face, you know what? Your dear sister, your dear brother, they went through some things in the past, but they were so inspi inspired, continue doing, doing the things for the Lord. And now, yes, if they did that in the past, I could also do that today. Why? Because of the power of the Holy Spirit that is at work. You may be okay right now, but sometimes, maybe next month, next few, few weeks, you're not okay? Remind yourself of those people who work so hard despite the difficulty and trials in life, despite their sickness. They continue to sing here, serve you, serve God and serve people. And you are inspired and you grow in your faith. You grow together. You grow with the church. Not only that, it's also the will of God to pray continually. I'm not saying that you drive your car and close your eyes and pray. Pastor said that I should pray continually. No, that's not the case. Don't go out of this church and stay with the mindset of praying without ceasing, praying continually with a closed eyes. The Bible doesn't tell us that we should pray in this kind of passion. No, you can pray with your eyes open. No, no, no version of the Bible that would tell us that you should only you could only pray when you are with closed eyes or when you're kneeling. Or when you are, or you, you can pray while working, you can pray while doing your stuff, when you're cooking, when you're driving, when you're gardening, when you're vacuuming, you can pray. You can pray everywhere, and that's very, that will give encouragement, inspiration to you and to the church. And when your, when your brother, your sister, they are down, they are broken hearted, pray continually with them. And that would encourage others, and you would also inspire them and build them up. And we are going to grow with the church. And that's the will of God. You can pray continually because it's not just be, it's because the command of God. But it's be, it is because it is the will of God. If it is the will of God, therefore you can do it. Because God will not command you something or, or, help, or ask you to do something without you. Without giving you the power to do it. Next, give thanks in all circumstances. You can give thanks in all circumstances. Not because it is the command of God, but because it is the will of God for you to give thanks in all, not for all. It says in all. You don't give thanks for your sickness. You don't give thanks for your failure, for your sickness, or for your, for your dilemma. But you give thanks to God for all, in all, sorry, in all circumstances. In all, not just with that situation, not just because of the problem, but in all circumstances, God can move things. In all things, God knows what to do. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And all these things, that's the will of God. If you do the will of God, then you grow in your faith. When you grow in your faith, and we all do, do, do the will of God, we all grow together. And the church would grow, and we grow with the church. Do you see the idea? Remember, this church, the Thessalonian church that Paul wrote, this letter, who, who, are, who, are, who were the, the original readers or recipient of the letter, they were just a young church. But they thrived. They grew because of their rejoicing, praying, and the prayer and their thanksgiving. Lastly, submit to the Spirit. If you want to grow with the church, you need to grow by submitting to the Spirit. It says there, straightforward, do not quench the Spirit or do not extinguish the fire of the Spirit or do not the other word from other, from other translations. Do not. Other translations. Can you tell me? What? Do not. Grieve. Grieve. Why grieve? Thank you for that. Grieve. Do not grieve the spirit. Because the spirit is a person. Pers the spirit is not an it. Spirit 
It's a person. You can grieve the spirit. You can quench the spirit. You can grieve the spirit. Because the spirit is not a myth. It's not a force. But it is. But he is a person. When you quench the spirit, when you grieve the spirit, it is to disobey the spirit's prompting. The spirit is prompting us daily, every minute, every second of the day. The spirit is speaking to us. Why? Because if you are born again, then you are filled with the spirit. You are, you are indwelt by the spirit and the spirit is always speaking to you. And when you disobey, you do something through your power and not through the power of the spirit, then you are quenching, you are grieving the spirit. As if you are disobeying your parents or you're disobeying your loved ones and then he's grieved, he is grieved by that. Then now, do not quench the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. Now, church, can we invite the spirit in this church? Can we invite the spirit? Come on, let us all say, we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Let us welcome the Holy Spirit in this church. Yes, I know that Holy Spirit is everywhere because oh, he, he is om, omnipresent. He is everywhere. But we want the power of the Spirit to manifest here. Let's invite the Holy Spirit in every area of our life. Let us invite our, the Holy Spirit in our family. Lord, we ask you, we ask the Holy Spirit to move in our family. In number seven, tri 17, Triumph Road. Lord, we invite the Holy Spirit. I invite the Holy Spirit at number eight, Cortina Place. I invite the Holy Spirit in this school. I invite the Holy Spirit in our company, in my workplace, in my office. I invite the Holy Spirit in my relationship with my friend, with my husband, with my wife, with my, with my fiancé. You invite the person, Lord, I invite the Holy Spirit in my interview. I will invite the Holy Spirit while I'm being, I'm being uh, undergoing through the operation. When I'm going through this, this procedure in the hospital, I invite the Holy Spirit. I cannot do it alone. I don't want to quench the Spirit or grieve the Holy Spirit by doing it through my, by my own strength and self. Because I am nothing. I am powerless without you. Because I'm only empowered through the Holy Spirit. Remember what Acts 1 8 says. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. Meaning, it is about the Holy Spirit's power that can help us to grow, can help us to do things beyond our ability, beyond our expertise. But God's Spirit is available for all of us because. He is a person who's trying to invite himself into our lives. Do not grieve him. Invite him. Walk with the Spirit daily. Moment by moment, walk with the Spirit. You cannot do it. I am already 53 years old, my friend. I, I've tried so hard to do it my own way, because, but I'm sure... I could attest to that, that I always fail when I rely on my own ability, my own strength. And it's so tiring to do it your way, to do it with your strength. My way, highway, no, it's God's way. Do not quench the spirit. Invite the Holy Spirit to manifest in our services, in all life groups, in all ministries. Let's invite the Holy Spirit. When you do something, even just merely mowing the lawn, just cutting the grass, walking, just invite the Holy Spirit with you. And it's so cool to come to you and with you. Don't think that the Holy Spirit is a boring person. No, he's, he's cool. He would join you in your jogging. He would join you when you go to the gym. He would join you when you're driving, when you're in the long drive. Come on. He's not. Invite him. Invite him. And we can build and encourage one another by obeying 
Holy Spirit. As we continue reading in verse 20, it says, Do not treat prophecies with contempt. We still believe in prophecies. Sad to say there are churches, there are other denominations in this world right now that no longer believe that the, whole, the prophecy, prophecies are still existent in this day and age. They say that prophecies, tongues, and the, and the likes, the power of move, the power, the move of the spirit are no longer evident or no longer applicable in our day and age. No, I still believe in the prophecies. I still believe in tongues. I still believe in the powerful move of the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. But test them all. Sad to say, there are prophets today. There are people today, pastors, teachers, Christians, who are abusing the gift of prophecy. They're so quick to utter prophecies to their own physical knowledge or their own strength. That's why there are many people also despise prophecies and reject prophecies right away. But I'm telling you, prophecies still exist in our day and age. But we have to test them. They should be aligned with the word of God. If that prophecy is against the word of God, it, is, it opposes the word of God. Then that's not a prophecy. That's not from God. Because when you hear prophecy, when someone uttered prophecy to you, then you have to check. Is this, is this word aligned with the word of God? If not, then reject it. We are not going to test the prophecies to reject them. We are testing them for us to accept it. We are not ready right away. Oh, that's a prophecy. I'm going to reject that. No, that's not the case. We have to test the spirit through our prayer, through our thanksgiving with the Lord. Check the word of God. If it is in line with the word of God, if it is also mentioned by some other leaders or teacher or, or the pastor or it confirms, then it is from the word of God. It, it is from the word. It is from the Lord. But we have to test them all. By responding and committing yourself and submitting the Holy Spirit, then you can check or test if that prophecy is indeed from the word of God. Right? And it says this. Reject every kind of evil. Reject. See, there's so many imperatives in how many verses? 11 verses with 18 or 19 imperatives. Wow. Paul wanted us to do something, really, for the Lord, for the church. Submit to the Spirit. Reject. And when you submit to the Spirit, you're going to reject every kind of evil. Evil. I don't, you know, I don't want to itemize all the things that you need to reject. It pertains to wickedness, evil deeds or evil things. You know it. When you know the word, you know exactly what is evil, what is to be rejected. If you know the word right away, you could check, you could spot the things that you need to reject. No, that's not coming from the Lord. I know the word of God. You cannot, you cannot deceive me. Satan, you who are deceiver, you cannot. I know the word of God. And even you, know, you don't know much of the word, but you have the Holy Spirit in you. The more you respond, the more you, you, you connect with the Spirit through your walk, moment by moment with the Spirit, you can right away feel this is not from the Lord. I need to reject this. I need to reject this. If you're having problem. Detecting what is evil or what is right, you need to spend time with God. When you spend time with your loved one, when you spend time with your dad, with your mom, you know right away what they want, right? And what they don't want. My kids, they all, always, right away, they know if that decision is not for me. Or they know right away if I'm going to permit them or not. Because they have close relationship with me. They won't ask me something that is against my will, they know exactly. The worst case scenario would be they would hide it. But I hope they're not hiding something from me. They can hide from me, but you cannot hide from God. You cannot hide from God. 
If you cannot hide from God, then you just have to submit to His prompting. Submit to the Spirit. Then reject every kind of evil. Praise God. Praise God. Let us grow together with the church. I want to ask you today, what are you personally committed to? to doing as a personal ministry to the body life of Lunch Presence Church. What do you want to be personally as your personal ministry for the body life of this church? What do you want? We need to grow with the church. We won't be the kind of church who would just continue to be what we call it burners of the peace we just don't come here to church to be expect, expect, spectators we are here as part of the body if you are part of the body it means to say you have a role to play Maybe you're a finger, you're a hand, you're an elbow, you're a shoulder, your knee, your leg, your, your foot. Then you have a role to play. Then there you have to make a resolution for yourself that I have to use my gift. You are gifted. From the minute you accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you are already gifted. You have to develop that and use that. Use it for His honor and glory. And that's the only time we could all grow together with the church. I only got this, Pastor June. How can I use that compared to yours, Pastor June? You're a preacher. You could share the Word of God. You could quote verses after verses. How can I use this knowledge? How can I use this talent for the Lord? I only got five loaves and two fish. How can I use that? You only got five loaves and two fish. Offer it to God. And God can feed the multitude with that little gift that you are claiming. Five loaves, two fish. Put it in the hand of God, and God would magnify it, multiply it, and use it for His honor and glory. Don't despise the small beginnings. Don't despise your talent, your gifts. God can magnify that, whoever you are, young and old, male and female. You can grow with the church. Visitors, new or attendees, members, you are here because God brought you here for a purpose. Starting today, you would grow. You must be, you must have that decision. You make a decision today that I would grow, that I may fulfill the call of God in my life. That all stand, so all stand. Oh, Jesus, thank you that you have brought us here together today. I would like to encourage and inspire some people today. And I'm, I know, God, that you are inspiring me as well and motivating me as well through the people in front of me. God, we are going to build one another up. We are going to encourage one another because you have called us to do so. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. God, thank you, God, that your word already touched every area of our lives. May it be finances, may it be jobs, may it be businesses, may it be our small emotional difficulties, may it be physical infirmities, may it be, Lord, relational problem, may it be ministerial problem. God, I pray that your word is alive and active right now touching the part of our bodies families career ministry right now God 
We want to serve you as a church. We want to encourage one another. We want to build one another up for your honor and glory. Help me to continue to submit to my brothers and sisters. Help our, my brother to submit to his sister. And I pray right now the sister will continue to submit to her brothers and vice versa. We are going to submit to one another. And if you are here today for the very first time, or maybe you've been here for so long, and you haven't had, had this experience of growth in your spiritual walk with you, with Jesus Christ, perhaps you need to accept Christ truly in your heart as your personal Lord and Savior. If you're here today, you want to experience growth in your life. You need Jesus in your life. You need the power of the Spirit. By inviting the Spirit in your life, it is by accepting Him into your life, into your heart, by asking for forgiveness. Pray this prayer with me wherever you are. You don't have to raise your hand. Just speak to God directly. Say this prayer with me. Jesus, I want to grow. I need you. Please forgive me. I confess all my sins. I believe that you died for all my sins. And today, you have forgiven me. I invite you to come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. If you pray that prayer, start reading the Word of God. And start praying. And you will experience tremendous growth.